actually the way to build an abundant life is through subtraction. I kind of spread myself really thin sometimes. If you want to learn something, serve somebody who already knows it. Can't necessarily just walk into being a passive investor and build generational wealth. A lot of times when you're running business or building a big life, it's lonely. If you're not doing everything you can to work towards your dreams, you'll end up working for someone else that's working towards their dreams. I might fail, I might fall flat on my face, but I'm not gonna be surrounded by the ghost of regret on my grave if I do that. You have to have a vision for your life or the first person you meet every day will give you theirs. All right, well today, as I mentioned before, we are here with Matt King, CEO of GoBundance. He's somebody that uh, I've been recommended to, to talk with plenty of times. I've been in talks with joining GoBundance and uh, couldn't think uh, more highly about the organization. I'm very excited about that as well. But Matt, thanks for joining us. And uh, would love to just kind of get into, you know, sort of your background, how you got started in business, and maybe take us, you know, on a couple minutes of, uh, you know, where you got started and, and where you are today. And then we'll, we'll, we'll dive into the whole story. Yeah, look, man, thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I've just uh, a simple, down-to-earth, easygoing guy from the Midwest, like y'all, born and raised just north of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, always grew up very sort of competitive in athletics, um, and then recognized that I was never going to be a professional athlete because I'm five, six and a half. And so I kind of started early on in my life to recognize that I needed to rehone that competitive skill into something else and something else that I could have a scoreboard for my life and define a win. Um, and so I started getting into business uh, just after high school. Um, started treating a job more like it was a company we ran. Uh, me and my buddies were in the locker room of North Shore Country Club for, for you guys, you know where that is, cleaning shoes. And we sort of treated ourselves like our own little business. We were buying candy for the guys. We were buying spray sunscreen for the guys. And then recognizing that we would make back that money through tips. And so we, we like didn't really ask for permission from the staff. We just kind of ran our own little department and our own little operation. And then from that, uh, I met a guy at the country club who said, hey, why don't you come help me print T-shirts and and uh, check out what that's all about. So I went over to his shop and, and started working for a guy printing T-shirts and vinyl signs and recognized pretty quickly that our styles were a little bit different, departed there and went and started my own company. And ever since, I've sort of just been looking for good people to follow, good people to learn from, good people to lean into and then try to launch and co-create things with them that we can own together, that we can build together, that we can scale together. I think that's a very concise and, um, you know, awesome background there. So, you know, now you're, you're CEO of GoBundance. Uh, I've read David Osborne's books and, and Pat's book. Um, so, and that was even before I kind of even knew what GoBundance was, but how, how did you get connected with, with those guys and with GoBundance? Yeah, look, I, I, I look at those guys as, as family. They're, um, very close mentors of mine, very close friends of mine, and, and both my boss. Um, I still run David's family office, so I'm really, really close to him, work out of his house most days. Uh, I met them at a, I met Pat at a camp for children with incarcerated parents one summer when we were living in Washington, D.C. He was a, an assistant chaperone for a charity I was volunteering for. And I've always done a good job showing up and asking questions. You know, there's a lot of people that use their mouth more than they use their ears, but we have more ears than we have mouth. And so I've always just leaned into the fact that if you ask good questions, people will open up like flowers and tell you their life story. And you can learn from their life story through their failures, through their successes. And then you can apply those things to your life and see if it gets better or if it gets worse. And I did the same thing with Pat. We were on a bus taking kids to Washington, D.C., and I just started asking him questions. And he said, I'm a real estate investor. He said, I'm a New York Times bestselling author. And he, you know, he said all these things. And rather than just letting them go in one ear and out the other, I listened to him and then I applied to him. And I, I said, okay, I'm going to pick up his book and I'm going to read it. And I didn't just read it. I read it in a day. And then when I read it, I didn't just leave it and go, that was a good book. I reached out to him and said, I just read your book. I read it in a day. What would it take to earn lunch with you? And then I kept reaching out to him. I kept learning from him because I understood that he was a person that was on a path similar to where I want to be in my life. He was walking and hiking the woods with his dogs at 9 a.m. He was enjoying all that life had to offer because he had built a life where he was financially free. And then at that moment in time, I started working for him. And then he said, hey, Matt, you're going to go volunteer at this thing called GoBundance. It's an entrepreneurial based mastermind group. I was 23 years old. I didn't even know what a mastermind was. I had to, I had to look up what a mastermind was. 
Um, and he said, you're going to work 18 hour days. You're going to sleep on a couch or an air mattress, but you're going to learn a lot. And I've always been the kind of person that just says yes. I believe that I have the ability to find the way or make the way to do whatever I want to do. And when people bring opportunities to me, when people bring suggestions to me, I just say yes and figure it out, right? So I went down to Orlando, volunteered at one of the first GoBundance events. That led to me volunteering at another GoBundance event, which led to me meeting David Osborne. And uh, I don't know why, but just subconsciously, I was attracted to David. Like I was like, that's the kind of person I want to be around. I want to spend more time with a person like that. I like who he is. I like how he operates. I like how he thinks. And I see myself in him from the perspective of being sort of ADD and wanting to do a lot of things. And so I just showed up. I just served. I just volunteered. I helped at the event. And then I got on the plane to fly back to DC and I rewrote my five-year vision. And that was one of the things I learned from these guys is you have to have a vision for your life or the first person you meet every day will give you theirs. So I had a five-year vision Said I live in Austin, Texas. I work for David Osborne. Two weeks later, he called me and he said, what would it take to get you to Austin? So there's a lot to unpack there. There's a couple things that I wanted to go through. I wish I had a pen, but I don't right now. I should have. But anyways, uh, I'm going to try to just remember it. So so a couple things there. First, um, I love how you said, and and I think we're pretty similar in some ways too, like ADD. I I do a lot of stuff. I'm always, Brock would say, I've never been diagnosed with it, but I I would. You got uh, it. Yeah, Brock would, (laughs) would, uh, would definitely uh, support that thesis. But so, um, the, the one thing that I wanted to, to talk to you about, and so the listeners of this podcast are a lot of people that are just trying to go out and build a life of health, wealth, and happiness, you know, in, in whatever format and, and sort of, and that, and that aligns really well, I think with go abundance's, you know, thesis and what you're talking about. So there's something that, that I struggle with a little bit is saying yes to everything. I, I, I yeah. like to say yes to everything. However, I start to realize that I kind of spread myself really thin sometimes. Mm-hmm. And so how do you guard against, you know, being that uh, someone that is opportunistic, that's looking for, um, you, know, uh, you know, new opportunities and saying yes to them while uh, not spreading yourself too thin and really honing in on that vision? Because I want to I translate into the, the five-year vision thing. I'm, I'm really big on goals, you know, you know, and, and have life visions written down that I, that I sort of, um, you know, uh, go in and edit from time to time based on new information. But I, I, I'd, if you could kind of unpack the, the yes to everything and how that, how you do that while, while still protecting your vision. Yeah, look, I say yes to everything that's in alignment with my vision. I think the mistake a lot of people make is they say yes to everything without keeping in mind what the vision they have for their life is or what the goals they have for their life are. And again, if you don't have a vision, the first person you meet every day is going to give you theirs. And so in your instance, when you have trouble saying yes to everything and spreading yourself too thin, that's you saying yes to someone else's vision, not you saying yes to your own vision. And so what I do is when I get an opportunity presented to me, I look at my five-year vision, I look at the goals I have for my life, and I say, does this align or does this not align? And if it doesn't, I just don't do it. It's an easy no. And I think people think that the way to build an abundant life is through addition, but actually the way to build an abundant life is through subtraction. And the way you subtract is you say no. And no is a complete sentence. You can put a period at the end of it. So many people feel as though they have to justify a no. You don't have to. All you have to say is no. And when you say no, what that does is it creates space for other things to pop up, other things to be created, which frees up more time for you to focus on your vision. And the more intentional you can live your life around your vision and the plans you have, the more successful I think you'll be in pursuit of that vision. I love it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, man. So yeah. the, there was some golden nuggets in there, and you said it twice. The, uh, the first person, and I've heard it phrased in a different way, like if you're not – doing everything you can to work towards your dreams, you'll end up working for someone else that's working towards their dreams. Um, but you, you said it in a different way, right? The first person you meet every day will, you know, basically get you to buy into their vision. And I think that's yeah. completely relevant. And then the other thing was uh, the way you build an abundant life is through subtraction. That's right. So, so how was from the, from the moment you read that book, right? And you decided, hey, yeah. I want to go meet David and I want to work with him. What was the you know timeline or journey from you know that first step to becoming the CEO of the company? Right, there's obviously that's not an easy ladder to climb. What what was what yeah. was it throughout that process? 
Well, you all got to remember, I'm a college dropout. So I've been always counted down and counted out inside of businesses. Like people just don't really pay attention to me because, oh, he doesn't have a degree. He's a college dropout. He's a failure, which probably means he's stupid, which probably means he's just going to be like the water boy. Um, and by the way, like that's my favorite place to be. Like I love to be counted down and counted out. There is nothing better for me. And so when I joined David's organizations, I was joining as essentially his assistant. He said, look, my world is a mushroom cloud getting ready to explode. I don't know what you're going to do for me, but if you're talented, you'll figure it out. And if you aren't, move back to wherever the hell you came from. And I was like, okay, wait, so heads you win, tails I lose. Okay, I'll take that bet. And I just went to work. I just started serving him. And I understood, y'all, that service is the Trojan horse to knowledge. If you want to learn something, serve somebody who already knows it. And when you serve them, they will give you all of their knowledge in return. And so that's what I did. I served David. I served him constantly, just making sure that he was focusing on his highest and best use in business, which we defined were vision, deal flow, and talent flow. If it wasn't one of those three things, I had to figure out a way to take it from him and do it. And uh, it took me 10 years to go from that go crew, that volunteer, to go abundant CEO. Um, I kind of served on the board in a sort of passive way with David and was a part of all of the business meetings. I went to a lot of the events with David because he's one of the owners. So I was always very involved, but it was never like, hey, I want to be the CEO of this company. As a matter of fact, we have two divisions. Technically, we have three, but we have two. Divi we had two divisions at the time. We had the elite division and we had the champions division. Champions, I have a $10 million and greater net worth. And there was an individual running champions who I have a ton of respect for and appreciation for, who I just thought he was missing the mark on how we should run the champions division. And so I went to David and said, look, man, I think we're missing an opportunity here. I think we're losing people. Let me step in and let me run this thing. And he's like, again, great, go for it. If you do well, we'll find an opportunity for you. And if you don't, we'll fire you. Like, okay, great. So heads you win, tails I lose. I got it, understood. Um, and so I stepped in and started running champions. And I did that for about five or six months before the uh, other owners of GoBundance approached me and said, hey, you've basically been bred by this organization, for lack of better terms. We would love for you to step in and be the CEO. And it, it was a hard decision. My wife and I had to have a lot of conversations around it um, because I wasn't willing to give up what I'm doing and still do for David. Um, you know, I have a ton of respect for David. He took a chance on me. He, he bet on me big. He invested in me from a, a knowledge and an education perspective. He married my wife and I, he was the first, him and his wife were the first people to meet our children. Like the man's like family. And so I'm not going to leave him. I'm not going to give that up. And the other owners were like, yeah, we're fine with you doing both. And so then my wife and I had to have a hard conversation. Like my life is going to be spread very thin. I'm going to travel a bunch. Unfortunately, we have this beautiful family. We're adding to the family. So are we okay with making this decision? And ultimately what we did y'all is we looked at our five-year vision we looked at our core values and we said like, yes, this opportunity gives us the ability to chase our dreams and possibly pursue all the things we wanted in our lives. So we said yes to it. And that's what's going on right now. Awesome. So what, um, like if you could, you started to go into go abundance and the two or three divisions, I'd like to just, if you, if you could just kind of break down go abundance, I, I have a better understanding. I haven't, I think I applied like two mm -hmm. years ago, but Colton just reached out again, uh, and I'm going to be meeting with him in the next week or two. So I might be in your, in the tribe some sometime soon here. But if you could, for the listeners, just give an overview of Go Abundance, the different divisions, what the mission is, and yeah. so on and so forth. Yeah. So so Go Abundance is an entrepreneurial based mastermind. Um, we have a men's division and a women's division. I run the men's side of the business. Um, we have three divisions. We have the Emerge division. We have the Elite division. We have the Champions division. Um, the champions have a net worth of $10 million or greater. The elites have a net worth of $2 million or greater. And then the emerge are, are sort of emerging. They're trying to aspire to that first million or that first $2 million in net worth. Um, and, and what GoBundance was created around was a lot of times when you're running business or building a big life, it's lonely. People judge you. You can't talk about things. People don't want to help you. People think you're stuck up. Um, and, and you hit a ceiling, you plateau very quickly because you don't have the right peer group that you're surrounded by that help you grow and evolve as a human, not just a business leader, by the way, as a human. And so what GoBundance does is it brings a community of like-minded men together who ultimately in their personal lives probably feel a little bit like the lone wolf and say, hey guys, you're now in a room of all lone wolves. Let's talk about how we can be better men, better husbands, better fathers, better contributors in our community and along the way, build wealth. 
and let's do it with vulnerability. Let's do it with accountability and let's do it with consistency so that we can continue to be the best versions of ourselves and break through any ceilings or any plateaus that we've hit in our lives. I think that's awesome. Not to put you on the spot, can you share any sort of success stories from like people that have joined the group and uh, you don't need to say names or anything, but just, just, you know, people that maybe joined early and, and where they went from. Well, look, man, I'll use my story because, because I never was an actual member of GoBundance, but I was like this quasi member sitting in the back of the room, right? The first time I did my GoBundance one sheet, which is a baseball card for your life that outlines everything from your new uh, from your um, income to your net worth to your goals to your health stats to what you need help help with etc right the first time i ever did my GoBundance one sheet my wife and i were living in washington dc at the time and our net worth was negative thirty thousand dollars because i had a twenty three thousand dollar loan on my car and seven thousand dollars in student loans and that was when i was 23 so that was approximately 11 years ago Today, our net worth is just shy of $7 million. And I don't say that to brag. I don't say that to show off. I don't say that to, I just say that like, literally you can do incredible things in your life over a very short relative amount of time if you stay consistent with a vision, with goals, and with intentionality around accountability. Like none of that wouldn't have been, none of that would be possible had I not have had the accountability I have in my life from people inside of GoBundance. I love it. And what else? So you mentioned too that you also are heading a family office. So go abundance. I'm assuming is kind of the majority of time. But what else? What else do you have going on in your professional life? I'd say I'd say go abundance is probably about fifty percent of my time. I'd say that uh, the family office I run for David Osborne, one of the founders, is probably about forty percent of my time. And I'd say about the other ten percent of my time is doing things that I want to do entrepreneurially, um, ideas and and sort of aspirations that I'm chasing personally. Um, you know, I, I kind of told somebody the other day, like I'm an intrapreneur and an entrepreneur. Like I like creating businesses inside of David's world. I like creating businesses inside of GoBundance and I want to create businesses outside of GoBundance. And, and they asked me, they said, why are you doing all of this? And I said, look, I have a dream for what's possible for my life. And I don't want my kids to look at me and say, wow, dad had a dream, but he went to a dead end job for 40 years. I want my kids to look at me and say, wow, dad had a dream and he chased it relentlessly. And so when they have a dream, they too will chase it relentlessly. Because y'all, your employees and your children, they never do what you say. They only do what you do. And so you have to be that leader that shows them the way and shows them the path. I might fail. I might fall flat on my face, but I'm not going to be surrounded by the ghost of regret on my grave if I do that. I'm going to get back up. I'm going to try it again. and I'm going to keep pushing forward. Okay, and what, so you said 10% other entrepreneurial journeys. What is, what, what, what's in there? Like what sort of exciting things you're working on over there? Like I, I mean, so I just bought a ranch in Austin. Um, I'm learning how to breed Texas Longhorns, which is an industry I know nothing about, but there's a ton of money in. Um, we're probably gonna use the ranch to create sort of like a, a farm type experience. Um, I put in an offer six weeks ago-ish on a, um, a well company here in Texas. I didn't get it but that's okay. I kind of lowballed it and wanted the seller to carry a bunch of paper. Um, I've put offers in on landscaping companies. We're working on starting a land clearing business right now that goes in and clears ranches from, from uh, a land perspective and gets rid of the, the bad invasive trees um, and then build fences. So I hired a guy off of Craigslist. I put him to work on my ranch as things were going well. I then responded to him and said, hey, why don't we try to see if we can actually run this as a business? Let's try to run it as a business with my own personal ranch first. If you can do it well there, then I'm going to go ahead and scale this into another business. So, you know, I kind of like to try to figure out how I can protect my downside without capping my upside, which is something I learned from Warren Buffett. Not that I've ever met the man, but I've listened to a lot of his information. And so I always put myself in a position where my downside's protected, but my upside is never capped. I love that. So on, on that, so I, I feel like I go back and forth on this sometime and you hear varying opinions, but as far as building, you know, as you're scaling as an entrepreneur, building parallel businesses, right? So it's common to, you start in one business, okay, that's that business has been set up, it's running, it's profitable, now you start another parallel business. And there's a point in your career where you can say, okay, now I can go into a completely different industry because I've already built this business to be running itself. Was that ever a thought process as you think? Cause there's, it seems like there's not necessarily, all these businesses aren't parallel, right? There's kind of some other stuff that might not be. What has been, what has been your thoughts on that or, or if any on that? 
I mean, look, I, I can tell already that on the disc, you're higher in the C than I am. And so you have a higher attention to detail, which means you have more discipline around consistency on task. So you as a human, just generally speaking, are going to be much better at sticking to that plan because you're not going to get bored as easy as I do. I'm going to bounce all over the place. And I'm going to be like, well, landscaping was fun. And the next logical thing is trees, but I'm sick of looking at green things. So I'm going to go look at wells and like something else, right? I would say, though, that the one thing that ha I have in common with all of these things that I'm looking at, that I'm pursuing, is they're providing a service to human beings that can't be outsourced to AI or technology yet. So no AI yet that I know of is coming in, meeting a customer, getting a quote together, drilling a well, putting the well in, and then running the system for the customer. Now, could that happen someday? Sure. But it's not there yet. Same is true with landscaping. Yes, I know there's automatic lawnmowers. I saw one actually the other day at Aaron Hills. Um, but there's no AI technology that is going to a consumer's house, going to an HOA, going to a commercial building, having a meeting, providing a service, and then delivering that service consistently. So from me, my perspective, the parallel is all around service. I just want to find businesses that I can provide a service that cannot yet be outsourced to AI or technology. And I'm looking for things that generate residual or recurring revenue. So I like businesses that have a subscription based model, if you will. So like that well septic system that I looked at, the reason I really liked it was because in Texas and maybe it's everywhere, but I know in the state of Texas specifically, once you have a septic system installed, it is required by law that you stay on a maintenance plan. So you have to have somebody servicing your septic system and looking at it on a quarterly basis. So if I can get into a business where I can provide a great experience to an installation, and then they have to get a maintenance plan, but they already got a great experience from me, they're probably gonna sign up and now I can clip a coupon from that customer for life. And when the system fails, there I am to pick up the work again, right? So I do look for parallels, they're just not as in parallel from an industry perspective, they're more parallel in terms of a structure perspective. Yeah, I like that. I, I definitely love uh, recurring revenue. That's one of the things we love about real estate. But if, in businesses, especially, you can uh, the multiples on on businesses that have recurring revenue uh, can be huge. Are you are you looking to start these businesses, scale them, and then sell them to like PE or something, or hold some of these for? I mean, look, like if the opportunity presents itself to sell, sure, I would sell if the numbers make sense. But at the end of the day, what I recognize through serving people like David and being around people in GoBundance is that true wealth, like absolute true wealth is built from cash flowing businesses. And so if I build a cash flowing business and I have this incredible money tree, if you will, why would I ever give that up? It's going to be so hard to replace that income. And even if I take all that income and I dump it into some asset or some fund or some other place, it's going to be really hard to match that same sort of cash on cash percentage, because for me, it's going to be infinite, right? And so, so long as the business is cash flowing, the operations team is in a good place and somebody doesn't offer me a stupid number, I'd rather just hold the business and cash flow the business than sell the business. Will I sell it? Yeah, eventually at some point, I'm sure I will, unless my kids want to take them over. But for me, I recognize that using real estate to build passive income is a way to financial freedom, no longer having to work in a job, but it's not a way to generational wealth. The way to generational wealth is through cash flowing businesses that you can take the cash flow and then dump that back into passive investing that then feeds your cash machine even greater. I like it. I like it. Um, no, that's all, all good points there. I think, uh, I, I listened to, uh, Similar to, I, I talk about him a lot on this uh, on this podcast, but Rob Deerdick, I don't know if you're familiar with him back from yeah, absolutely. Uh, like Rob and Big back in the day, but he's doing a lot of incredible stuff in business and he, he has his own like venture studio and he builds and scales these businesses and then will either hold them for the cash flow or sell them and then dump that back into commercial real estate and uh, kind of that same exact model that you were talking about. I think I think a lot of times the buzz the buzzword of passive income is used, right? And I think it's you're totally right. Where it's you can't necessarily just, you know, walk into being a passive investor and build generational wealth, right? The common way is if you want to take the passive investor route is you need to have some sort of active income or active business that is going to generate that cash, right? Where you can then push it over to a passive investment vehicle that will feed it all passively, right, and build a life that way. So I totally agree there. I think a lot of people think they can just skip right to the passive income part, but it's like, well, there's a 
there's an active income stage that can be 10, 20, 30 years long before you hit that true passive income stage. That's right. That's right. And even once you hit that stage, unless you have a team in place, it's actually still active because you have to pay attention to it. You have to make sure the rents were received on time. Got to file the taxes. Like really the way that you actually get to passive income is you get to be a great leader and you lead teams and you hire people. You understand how to hire people. You understand how to empower people. And through leadership, you can establish passive income, but you can do that anywhere. You can do that in a job. You can do, I mean, you could do that anywhere. Um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's going to be way less active from a real estate perspective, but you're still going to be required to put in some work. So you talk a lot about leadership, right? I think based on our conversation so far, it sounds like that's really your superpower. What would be, you know, tips or tricks for someone that want to become a, you know, high performance leader and what's your journey been there to learn that? Yeah. So like the one thing I would say is I would tell you that leadership is not my superpower, but I understand that leadership is the superpower gene that's required to get to where I want to go. And I don't believe that I will ever actually be a superpower leader. I think I'm going to have to evolve and continue to grow. And even when I think I've gotten to the place I need to be, I'm going to have to become a different version of me. Um, so I understand it's going to be a constant evolution. From a leadership perspective, I think really good leaders are really good listeners. And so I hired a communications coach about 12 months ago. Um, I worked with her for about six months and I understood the power of listening and communicating as a skill, not just as a part of life, but as a skill. And so for instance, like one of the tools and techniques I use is a thing called RASA, R-A-S-A. -A. And you guys can look this up on YouTube. There's tons of TED Talks on it and everything. It's a pretty simple concept, but the concept basically goes receive, appreciate, summarize, and ask. And so you would say, hey, Brock, thank you so much for that compliment, man. I, I really appreciate that. What I hear you saying is that you think that I've become a great leader and that's what's gotten me to where I'm at. Let me ask you a question. What do you think the greatest trait of leadership looks like? And now Brock immediately knows I heard him. I understood him. And now I'm asking him questions to engage him in the conversation. But more importantly, I'm asking him conversations to get more questions answered for me so I can better answer his question. Because when he says leadership is communication, leadership is attention to detail, all these things, I could say, look, man, your definition of leadership and my definition of leadership are very different. And here's what my definition of leadership is. And how do you feel about that? Right. And you always use these questions as a way to to continue the conversation and make people feel engaged. And so in leadership, I believe you have to be a very, very good listener. And notice I didn't say a great communicator. I think you have to be a great listener. Your people are going to tell you things that they're feeling or seeing without being direct and telling it. You're going to have to be able to read through the tea leaves. You're going to have to read through their emotions. You're going to have to read through the email. And you have to be a good listener. The other thing I would say is I believe that in order to evolve and grow as a human being, not just as a leader, you have to be willing to accept feedback. And you have to be willing to accept feedback, look at it, and then apply it to your life if you choose. And look, I would never take criticism from somebody I wouldn't take suggestions from, right? Like I'm not going to take criticism from a guy I would never listen to from an advice perspective. So the critics, they're going to be out there. You ignore them. That's okay. But when you find mentors, when you find peers and they give you feedback and they give you information, do something with it. Look in the mirror and see how you feel. Ask yourself, is this really me? Take it to a loved one. Take it to your parents. Take it to your business partner. Say, hey, I just received this feedback and honestly, it kind of hurt. But what do you think? And see what they say. And they'd be like, yeah, I've been feeling that too. Like, wow, thank you so much for sharing. Now let me go do some self-reflection in a journal or on a walk or on a hike, whatever it looks like, and see how I can use that advice to change my life. And I believe when you do that inside of leadership as well, inside of companies as well, you will really change the trajectory of your abilities because you are now growing and evolving at a pace much more rapidly than most because you're taking all this input from everywhere else and applying it to your life. Eloquently put, just like this whole thing has been. Um, so I think that's great. I don't know. Uh, did you have any more questions about leadership? or? No, I think that, I think that makes sense. I answered it. I was going to ask you, how do you balance? Because obviously you're a very busy guy. We talked about how you spend your time and, and how you're so, – so how do you balance like the family time – you know, things mm -hmm. that you like to do. I know it's, you saw, you mentioned Aaron Hills. I saw that you like to golf. We like to golf a lot too. Um, you know, how do you balance, you know, uh, overall well-being? Yeah. 
Yeah. So look, y'all, like I, I was just actually sharing with someone on my team this perspective earlier. A lot of us in life believe that we have to balance by carrying all of these different buckets, right? Like we've got the family bucket, we've got the friend bucket, we've got the health bucket, we've got the business bucket, and they're all filled with a limited amount of water, right? We only have so much water we can put into these buckets. And so if we want to fill the health bucket, that means the family bucket might get drained or the business bucket might get drained, right? I look at balance more from this perspective. An eagle soars. And you know what an eagle uses to soar? It's wings. It uses a right wing and a left wing. And the right wing allows it to balance and the left wing allows it to balance. I try to live my life like the center of the eagle. And I don't try to balance things. I try to bring everything to me and use all of them as a way to balance and continue to soar in my life. I don't look at things like buckets like I need to fill. I look at like my wife and kids are along on the business trip. And the business trip is along on the trip to Columbia, South Carolina, because one of the owners of GoBundance is there. And, oh, I'm going golfing, but I'm going to go golfing with a business person. And I'm going to walk so I get my steps from a health perspective. So I don't try to necessarily balance. I try to be the body of the eagle and understand that my life is the left wing and the right wing. And I'm going to use those to continue to soar and navigate the way I want to live. I like it. That's a great analogy. Um, you know, so... Getting close to the end here, I, I would like to kind of understand, you know, going back to GoBundance, mm -hmm. as I talked about before, I'm I'm uh, I'm definitely interested. So I'll be talking with Colton soon. But what do you what do you see as sort of like what's your? I, I know you have your five year vision for your life, but yeah. what's your vision for GoBundance as as CEO? Yeah. Look, man, like if I'm laying on my deathbed and my kids are looking at me and saying, "Dad, you've made an impact on the world." and you made an impact on our lives, we're gonna miss you like I can die a happy man. Like, I don't even care if they miss me, honestly. As long as I make an impact on their lives, I'm good. As long as I make an impact on the world, I'm good. And so from my perspective, I believe through the experiences that I've already had, that if we can use GoBundance as a conduit to continue to evolve and develop as men and become the best version of men that we possibly can, that we can then impact our communities our family, our businesses, and the world in a much more meaningful way than we could individually. And so I'm trying to create a collective group of men that are all focused on getting 1% better in all aspects of life, not just in business, not just in health, but in all aspects of life, bringing their families, their communities, and their businesses along on this journey and seeing if we can impact the world with that. And I truly believe we can. That's a great question. Uh... Great response there. And like I said, certainly uh, aligns very well with what we're trying to talk about on this podcast. So I think that's, uh, I think this is going to be a great episode. I can already what, tell. What are the, so I know there's a ton of stuff that's obviously goes into joining the program. And, you know, like you said, 1% better each day. But if there are just one or two quick tips you could give to, to you know, to hit that 1% better in each day of those aspects of life, what would it be? Yeah, I would tell you to read the book Atomic Habits by James Clear, and I get no you know, endorsement deal or any of that stuff for telling everybody to read this book. But go read the book Atomic Habits and take the habit tracker he has and apply it to your life. Put your habits on it, print it out, stake, staple it to your wall, tape it to your mirror, whatever you got to do. I have mine in my journal. Then write a five-year vision for your life and say, okay, the year is 2029. Here's what my life looks like. And make sure that the daily habits you're doing are in alignment with your five-year vision. If your five-year vision is, I'm living a healthy life, I'm a handicap of four for golf, and none of your habits include hitting golf balls and staying healthy, you're never going to get there. Like, yep. I promise you will never get there. You're not going to wake up one day at four. Like, you're going to have to work to get there. So the one thing I would tell everybody to do is read that book, understand the power of momentum, understand how your habits are going to feed your five-year vision and your five-year vision is going to feed your habits and make sure you audit the habits you're doing on a daily basis and that they're in alignment with where you want to go for five years. Beautiful. I like that. One uh, slightly follow up to that. So you strike me as a guy that has a, a badass morning routine. What's your, yeah. what's your morning routine? Well, so today was a little bit off because I had to get a blood draw at 5 a.m., which most people won't even be able to figure out how to get a blood draw at 5 a.m., but that's just kind of what I do. So, um, most mornings I wake up at 417. I get up, we have a gym in our backyard. I go down to the gym. Um, I'll work out for anywhere between 45 and 55 minutes. I'll sit in our sauna. We keep our sauna at about 207. I'll sit in there for 11 minutes, 11 seconds. You can see I have a thing with odd numbers. I don't like even numbers. Um, so I'll sit in the sauna for 11 minutes and 11 seconds. Then I'll flip over to our cold plunge. That's at 45 degrees. I'll sit in there for three minutes and 33 seconds. 
If I have enough time, I'll do it again. If I don't have enough time, then I'll go and get ready. I do spend time reading or journaling in the sauna and or in the cold plunge using audible books or looking on my phone or actually holding physical books too at times. Um, and then I'm usually out the door between 6.15 and 6.30 every day to get to the office. I, I love the specificity of like, you know, I wake up at this time. Oh, dude, it's OCD exactly, for and sure. you're, you're obviously, you know, I think that's super important, right? Valuing your time and figuring out like creating that life optimization I know we talked about, right? I think there's a lot of, you know, people that just don't really have parameters around that. It's kind of just waking up each day and wherever the day goes, yeah. the day goes. But if you have those kind of specific things, like I'm going to do these four things before my day even starts, you're heading into the day like dialed, right? You're ready to go. You're ready to attack the day. Whereas a lot of people kind of just, whether it's a morning routine or anything else, might just roll out of bed and whatever the first phone call is, the first phone call is, or whatever yeah. the first email is, the first then email your day's is. completely running you instead and of running exactly. the day. Yep. All right, Winning Wealthers, that was Matt King, CEO of GoBundance. I think that's going to be a absolute great episode. Uh, Matt had a lot of great one-liners and quote after quote that you can tell that he absolutely does live by. You know, a couple of things he said was the way you build an abundant life is through subtraction. I completely agree with that. Uh, he talked about protecting his downside without capping his upside. And, you know, he, he, he had a, uh, an analogy um, for his life being an eagle soaring versus looking at life where you have buckets and um, taking away from certain buckets to do other things. He's, he's trying to, you know, achieve balance in, in his life by being that the body of the eagle soaring. So if you liked it, as always, please share, smash the like button. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you so much. And uh, that's a wrap.